To date, your tips have led to the capture of 155 of America's Most Wanted. Now, the long arm of the law is reaching out for Kelvin Leroy Bryant. Police say his vicious gang picked two innocent citizens off the streets of Miami, terrorized them through the night, then killed just for fun. And Lyndon Jackson Little. Police say he shot his own wife. I was shot right there in the head. Tonight, Susan Little fires back on America's Most Wanted. America's Most Wanted. I think I have seen this guy. Any in the vicinity and any units to handle? Please stop! Probably nothing. from Washington. It's Friday, June 21st, and I'm John Walsh. Last week, we put out the call and you picked up the phone. Before our broadcast was over, your tips had police banging on the door of a convicted killer, a man accused of killing again. He managed to slip away, but he's not off the hook yet. We're back on his trail tonight with more details later on in the hour. But first, an incredible story from Oklahoma. Incredible because a woman was shot between the eyes and survived. Her name is Susan Little. She suffered for years in an abusive marriage. One day, she found the courage to walk out, and for a while, things were better. Until one night in Midwest City, Oklahoma, in January of 1984. Susan Little was in her kitchen when police say her ex-husband, Jack Little, came knocking at the door. What are you doing here? I thought Susan told you. Wait a minute, Jim. Clyde? shot right there in the head and it uh, came out my neck and then I was shot twice in the back when we were en route the dispatcher indicated that there were two people down and that uh, the assailant was possibly the gunman was possibly still there you could still smell the gun smoke we then saw Clyde Craiger, and we also found Susan Little. We spoke with her, thinking we were receiving a dying declaration. Ma'am, who did this to you? Huh? Jack who? Little. What kind of car is he driving? Jack and I grew up in the same neighborhood in Memphis. I had known him for years, and then we reacquainted uh, when I was about 18 or 19, started going out, then we got married. Four kids, and 14 years later, the couple moved to Oklahoma. Get the damn noise! Get your nose out of that damn book. Just trying to make us a little money. Oh, you didn't seem to mind the money I made when I was working. Let me explain something to you. You, you may be too stupid to understand this, but they don't hire electricians with bad backs. Not in Oklahoma, not in Memphis. That's why they pay me disability. It's a good thing I don't get my real estate license. Oh, you and your damn real estate license. Get me some damn dinner! Hey, Dad, you want to see my curveball? I'm busy. We'll find somebody else. Over the years, it became worse and worse. He totally dominated me and the kids. I s stayed married for almost 20 years. He had me convinced that whatever was wrong in our life and our marriage was my fault.
Susan's father died in 1983, and the couple went back to Tennessee for the funeral. But even during her grief, Susan says Little continued his abuse. Stop your damn crying. He was 81 years old. Everybody's got to die sometime. Doesn't mean I can't cry for my own dad. Let me explain something to you. From now on, I do what I want. You got that? There ain't gonna be no divorce. The house and the money are mine. You know, I could kill you right now. I could dump your body down there in the river. Nobody ever knows. Well, that's a good one. Back home in Oklahoma, right Susan began looking for a way out. She nice. found an ally and family friend, Clyde Krager. I don't know what I'm going to do, Clyde. I'm about at the end of my rope attack. Well, you're just going to have to do what you got to do, Susan. It's the only way you're going to feel good about yourself. Got a boy. Watch this, right here. Clyde. Put it right over here. Nice one. By the authority of the state of Oklahoma, the court grants the divorce. In the matter of property, the court determines that the farm in Tennessee will be awarded to Jack Little. The house in Oklahoma will belong to Susan Little. Susan stayed in Oklahoma, and Little moved back to Tennessee. But the abuse didn't stop. Hello? You having a lot of fun? I told you before, Jack. Leave me alone. I ain't leaving you alone till I get what's mine. I want the house and the savings. What <sighs> you got the farm. It's not fair you taking everything. Now you listen. No. You listen to me for a change. I'm not scared of you anymore. That's it. Sure. Damn. The night of the shooting, I got home a little bit before seven. I was in the kitchen cooking. Um, my four kids were home. Uh, Clyde was there watching television. Uh, a little bit after seven, I heard a knock at the door. I'll get it, Susan. I didn't think anything about it. Um, Clyde went to the door and it was Jack. What are you doing here? I thought Susan told you. This is what you get for interfering. Whoa, wait a minute, Jim. What? Jack had the gun in one hand, and with the other hand, just threw the stove aside. I was trapped. I was shot really at almost point blank range. I didn't feel the pain of the bullets. I felt the impact. It was very cold and methodical. He's nothing but a coward. And the kids saw him, I think, for the coward and for the murderer that he is. I don't. Uh, know how kids can ever adjust to a nightmare like that. They have to have it in their minds forever and there's no way to bring back a life that's been lost. Police say Jack Little left his wife for dead and his children in shock. One unsung hero that night, Susan's 13-year-old son Lee. After the shooting, he ran out of the house and called 911. It was an act of bravery that helped save his mother's life. And his mom is with us tonight in our studios. Thanks for joining us, Susan. It took incredible courage for you to relive your ordeal. We know that Jack Little's still out there. Why did you choose to tell us your story? Because my children and myself will never be safe or have any peace until he's uh, caught. 
And because he's, he must uh, pay for his crime. He's killed someone and he's uh, made a nightmare for my children forever. And I think there's got to be justice. What advice would you give to someone that might be watching this program that's in an abusive relationship like you were? I would advise any woman to get out of it immediately and to get their children out of it because they're responsible for their children and uh, kids deserve a better life than living in any type of abusive situation. I hope they're listening and I hope they heed your advice and thanks for your courage Thank for being you. here. So let's get busy and help Susan Little find some peace of mind. This is Jack Little's 1977 passport photo. Little collects guns. He's an excellent marksman. And friends say he's an active in survivalist groups. Here he is after a 1978 arrest in Memphis. Little has a one-inch scar on his left eyelid. Notice the bump here on the bridge of his nose. Forensic artist Harvey Pratt retouched this photo. It shows what Little might look like today at age 49. There's a good chance he's balding now and that his hair is probably graying. Police believe Little is still hiding out somewhere near Memphis, Tennessee, where he has family. So if you've seen Glendon Jack Little, call 1-800-CRIME-91. Special Agent Chuck Choney from the FBI and Major Brandon Claves from the Midwest City Police Department are in our studios waiting to talk to you. And Susan Little is waiting, too, for the day when she can live without looking over her shoulder. When we come back, the distraught mother of a victim needs your help. I miss my baby. I miss her so much. The way she was tortured, she knew she was going to die. <laughs> In April, we asked your help in finding four-year-old Michael Dunahy. This week, a new development in that case. While two second graders were playing on a suburban street in Berlin, New Jersey, a stranger drove up, offered them candy, and then tried to grab them. This time, the children managed to break free, but they saw another child in the back of that man's car, and they identified that child as Michael Dunahy. March 24th, Victoria, British Columbia. Police say Bruce and Crystal Dunahy were watching a touch football game near this playground. Their four-year-old son, Michael, was playing nearby. Then suddenly, he was gone. Have you seen Michael Dunahy? When we first profiled the case on April 5th, several viewers in New Jersey told police of a boy fitting Michael's description. Harry Crush called from Maple Shade. I recognized the picture from the show. I had seen the child the previous day. And the child had said his name, but I only caught the Michael. So when I saw the picture, I was sure that this was the same child. Crush gave a police artist a description of a man he'd seen with the boy. The man does not look good. He is not handsome or pretty in any way, shape, or form. The man is ugly. Police distributed flyers else? in Notice a three-state area, but no leads emerged until two days ago when seven-year-old Michael Jordan told police of a man who looked just like the man in the poster. He had bumps on his face. He had real, like, bumps like this. Yeah, like, he was like this, bumps on his face. Oh, big, he looked ugly. Michael told police he and a friend were riding their bikes at this intersection in Berlin, New Jersey. They said a man offered them money and candy. Then the stranger tried to grab his playmate. My friend was crying when she said, get away from me before I snap your hand. And she snapped it real hard before she even said, get away from me before I snap your hand. And she snapped it real hard, and then, then he got away. Michael also saw two children in the back of the man's car. Well, when I saw the little boy in the back, he was crying. The little girl was, like, weeping, like, trying to, like, get her eye stuff out. She's, like, almost crying. We showed him a flyer, a copy of the flyer, and they definitely agreed that it was this suspect along with Michael Donahue in the back of the vehicle. Hang in there, sweetie. We're going to find you. No matter what it takes, we're going to get you back. We're not going to give up. We know he's out there and we'll get him. We'll find him. No one can be sure it was Michael, but police are working overtime in the New Jersey area tonight. Maybe you spotted a man who looks like this. He may be driving an older model blue Chevy Camaro. If you've seen him or know anything about little Michael Dunahy, call us at 1-800-CRIME-91. Random violence can strike anywhere, and a family of cops learned that fact in a very painful way. 
Three years ago, Major Arnold Gibbs of the Miami Police Department publicly spoke out against the random violence plaguing the streets of Miami. He told reporters, quote, there seems to be little concern for human life. He never imagined that violence would one day claim his own little sister, who police say just happened to fall into the hands of a very vicious gang. This crime spree began in a rough and ravaged part of Miami called Liberty City. A small gang was working a common crime game, using a prostitute to lure someone to a dark place where they could rob him. But on this night, police say the gang wasn't having much luck. Damn, man. man. What's up with that girl? She can't pick up nobody, man. Frustrated with their failures, the gang looked for easier prey. Police say they spotted a pretty co-ed named Bridget Gibbs and her date in a parking lot. Yo, my man. You know where this liquor store is at? Oh, uh, yeah, this one down there. Yeah, about how far? I don't know how far. Somebody said it was one near here. We don't know. Well, I don't know. So, no! 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 I miss my baby. I miss her so much. I didn't have to worry about her running the streets. She was home. She'd go to a movie, you know, maybe once or twice, and maybe her friends would have a birthday party or something, she would go. But she wasn't the type. That's what makes her so special and never give me one day's problem. With Bridget and her date locked in the trunk of their own car, the gang cruised Miami, stopping to buy beer with the money they stole from their victims. The last stop was an abandoned house in Liberty City. The gang continued to terrorize their victims, this time wrapping their heads and arms with duct tape. She enjoys singing mostly. She loved to sing. She sang in the church choir. And she sang around the house all day, constantly. And everybody knew her as being a singer, you know. Everybody knew she had a beautiful voice. She loved to sing. <laughs> At around 5 a.m. on February 6th, the gang drove to a causeway bridge over Biscayne Bay. Then police say they took Bridget from the car and while still bound and gagged, threw her off the bridge. <laughs> the way she was tortured, she knew she was going to die and she couldn't even call. That's what I, they tie your hands behind her back. That's what I so bad. She knew she was gonna die. She, she couldn't even call for him. The next day, Bridget's body washed up to this seawall. The following day, we learned who the hooker was and went to her apartment. With a warrant, we arrested her and also recovered some of Bridget's property. I would like to see him suffer a little bit the way I suffer. He still wouldn't suffer like I am, but at least he would maybe have time to think, to know what he'd done to my baby. And if he can live with that, then I know it's no hope for him. Miami police have arrested three gang members, but they're still searching for murder suspect Kelvin Bryant, one of the last people to see Bridget Gibbs alive. Metro-Dade police have charged Kelvin Bryant with robbery and grand theft auto, but they really want to question him about the death of Bridget Gibbs. Bryant goes by the nickname JIT, J-I-T, or WIMP, but he's also used the alias Walter Bryant. He spent part of his high school years in a juvenile detention center, and he's never held a job. Police believe Kelvin L. Bryant may be in northern Florida or Georgia. If you know where he is, call us now. The number is 1-800-CRIME-91. When we come back, a series of bomb blasts shakes a small town in upstate New York. Next, New York State Police say the first cop on the scene was a little bit too close to the crime.
This program makes Joseph Harper nervous. For 10 years after he disappeared, nobody heard from him. But then we began showing his profile. Now every time we do, he contacts his lawyers. When Harper calls, he sounds edgy and talks about turning himself in. But so far, he hasn't. Maybe tonight, your calls can help him make up his mind. was five minutes after 10 on August 2nd, 1978, when three sticks of stolen dynamite rocked the suburban community of Woodbury, New York. Report of an explosion on the railroad tracks north of Pine Hill Road. Woodbury police immediately dispatched a fire crew to investigate, but it was Officer Joseph Harper who found the site of the blast. Hey, Joe, what do you got? He was the first on the scene. Explosion, I'm pretty sure. Pretty big one, about a damn jet there. How'd you get here so fast? We had a hell of a tire fight in this place. No, I just happened to be cruising by. I thought I saw the flash. Then I got the call. I came right over. There was definitely concern, probably fear with people. He wanted to show that he was better, a better investigator than anybody in the area. He was able to find things that nobody else could find. Nobody else knew where the dynamite was taken from. Shaken by the bombings, the community was glad to have a man like Joe Harper on the case, and so were his superiors. Sergeant, my report on the bombing is ready. Everything you need to know is in there. Thanks, Joe. August 9th, the town garage in Woodbury, New York. safe to say that there aren't very many policemen who in their careers will be first responders to an explosion to begin with. Uh, it does happen, surely, but two in a row, it starts to get some wheels rolling. The Orange and Rockland substation is located two miles from Woodbury and lights up the entire New York Central Valley with 69,000 volts. And that's where, on August 11th, the mystery bomber struck again. But now the Woodbury police had a suspect, and that suspect was Joseph Harper. after the explosion, the entire community was plunged into darkness. What happened, Mommy? I don't know, honey. And when investigators arrived on the scene, they found exactly what they expected. Harper was already there. How far the circle of debris goes to the point of the explosion. It was right about that Harper. filler back there. Just like the Marines, first one in. How'd you find it? What, you got x-ray vision? Superman, I guess. Don't jerk my chain. Look, what we have here is a TNT explosion, probably, judging from the amount of destruction. Let me show you what we got over here. We are now fairly certain in our minds that we may be on the right track here by keeping Joe Harper as a prime suspect in this matter. We thought he was out doing his job, only he was out doing a job on us. Do you live in the United States? Yes. But a theory wasn't enough. Jerry Stromer needed a confession. So he ordered a polygraph to persuade Harper to come clean. Where was your first police job? Monroe. Were you the first officer to arrive at the site of a bombing on August 2nd? Yes, I was. 
Did you set off a bomb on August the 2nd? No, of course not. Did you set off a bomb on August 3rd? No. On August 9th? No. What about August 11th? No. Come on, Joe. Talk to me. Well, let's end it right now. We know you're lying, Joe. When the needle jumped, Jerry Stromer knew he had his man. The mystery bomber was finally unmasked. And on November 20th, 1979, Joseph Harper pled guilty to first-degree criminal mischief. But faced with up to 25 years in prison, Harper fled. Harper has eluded three law enforcement agencies for more than 11 years, so let's take a good look at the clues. Harper could give himself away by bragging about his electronic expertise, and he could be working in that business. Harper's a guy you might not normally notice, but you might notice a half-inch scar over his right eye. He was last spotted at a flea market in Margate, Florida. That was in the spring of 1990. If you've crossed paths with Joseph Hamilton Harper, call us now. The number is 1-800-CRIME-91. Next up, a middle-aged mom earns the respect of some of L.A.'s toughest kids. We walked in there, and they're like, oh, she's the coordinator of this and that. And she's sitting there, hi. You know, and I was like, what's a white lady know about anything and about gangs, you know? Here's an important update. Last week, we told you about the death of a young rap singer, and our hotline was flooded with calls. You found his accused killer, but he got away just 20 minutes ahead of police. They're hot on his trail, but tonight they need your help. You flushed Daryl Smith out of hiding. Now let's help police bring him in. Michael Merritt was a rising rap star from Sarasota, Florida, working hard to make it in the music world. See the use of cocaine, I can never condone. Cause once you try the drug, man, your mind is blown. You wouldn't listen to us, now you're going, you're going. I said a high is so far that your mind will be blown. But Sarasota police say his career abruptly ended when he was shot and killed by Daryl Smith. Minutes after we showed you this story, the calls came in tracing Smith to Columbia, South Carolina. Police confirmed your early tips. Smith had lived in this Columbia house. But just five days before our broadcast, Smith moved on. More calls came in last week, putting police back on Smith's trail. Now the calls were coming from Atlanta, Georgia. I picked up the phone immediately and called uh, America's Most Wanted to try to, to try to give as much information as I possibly could to help them apprehend them. Atlanta police sent six units to the Heritage Plantation, a low-income housing complex. Police say it's a hot spot for drug dealers. Unfortunately, police were not the only ones tipped off by our broadcast. After moving on that uh, tip, we moved in that particular area and learned shortly after that the subject had been given information that he was, his picture was on TV, and information that we received at that particular time that he had been moved out of the area and possibly shortly thereafter left town. Smith is a native of Miami, and he goes by the nickname Mutt. He's also used the alias Tony Brown. Some callers spotted Smith last week because of this clue. He has four gold front teeth, two upper and two lower. And he has a tattoo on his chest, a heart with the word Mary over it. Friends in South Carolina have seen Smith driving two vehicles. One is a white four-door 79 Buick with Georgia plates. The other is a tan over green Ford Bronco with Florida tags. If you've seen Daryl Smith, Call us now at 1-800-CRIME-91. Detective Larry Kimball from the Sarasota Police Department is back with us tonight, ready to pick up Smith's trail. A lot of people think there is no solution to the gang violence in L.A. So far this year, there have been 183 victims of drive-by shootings. But a teacher in Los Angeles has a whole school full of gang members. A lot of them have long rap sheets, but there's no gang violence at her school. 
You see, she has a different way of dealing with them. She's tough, but she cares. Her name is Joan Lewis. She works her magic on the campus of Granada Hills High School, and she manages to find some common ground. Lena Nozizwe has the story. EWF, it stands for Every Woman's Fantasy. And it's what 17-year-old Ernest Gillette calls his posse. He belongs to EWF because he says when you live in South Central Los Angeles, you have to belong to something. But he doesn't really feel safe until he goes to school. I go out there to stay out of trouble. <laughs> 18-year-old Lewis is from the East Valley, a well-known gang neighborhood. He belongs to the King family. It's just, you know, family. We don't worry about gang banging. We don't, we're not into that, you know. The King family is an ally of the more famous and fearsome gang called the Crips. The family offers protection. But Ernest and Lewis only really feel safe when they reach Granada Hills High, a school nestled in a suburban neighborhood of the San Fernando Valley. With more than 30 different gangs represented in the student body, you might expect to find violent rivalries. Instead, kids bust in from gang neighborhoods find a sanctuary here, a neutral zone. Police by the lady in the pink pantsuit. She comes armed with nothing more than a walkie-talkie and Reeboks. Hey, if you two want to ride home, you stop where you are. You two had a problem, is that correct? You go, you go get on your bus, you get on your bus and check with the dean's office tomorrow. He'll stay. Now, when you first saw her, you started laughing. Why? Because it's like we walk in there and they're like, oh, she's the coordinator of this and that. And she's sitting there, hi. You know, and I was like, what's a white lady know about anything, you know, about gangs? In the beginning, Joan Lewis didn't know much, but the former English teacher was forced to learn. I come from a middle class background and some of the things I didn't understand, but I kept asking them questions. So, though they thought that they were learning from me, actually, I was learning from them. And it was a two-way street. Lewis has unlikely help on the front lines of gang control. The 78-year-old keeper of the gate is known as Granny. Who won't get through the door? The gang bangers. They won't come through this door. They'd rather hop the fence. <laughs> Why is that? On account of me, because they're scared of me. This way, honey. IDs. Take your color off and give it to me. Also on the team, Lewis's 22-year-old daughter, Lori. Part of Lori's job is checking out what students wear. What's the deal the students there? are not allowed to wear colored belts, especially blue or red belts, but any belt that could be identified as a gang member. And that goes for all students, you know, gang member or not. Stripping gang members of their colors reduces the chance of violence, but hostilities remain. So Lewis uses the classroom as therapy. Every week, students get a chance to work out their differences with words. And what I want to say is, like always, what's, what's said in this room stays in this room. If you're going to sell drugs, why you got to sell drugs to a black man? That's what I'm That's saying. Fine. Is it okay to sell to other people? Why kill your own people? I think this problem is, no offense, but it's white people, man. Killing off each other with cocaine and for money, G. Nah, you better break the habit. For Ernest, these sessions are a forum for auditioning new rap songs about his life. I'm positive. Cut the gang violence and you will find that a lot will live. Woo! What we find is that in our support groups, when things are happening in the city, they come back into the classroom. And there has been a lot of racial tension in the city, and the kids want to talk about it. White people is innocent, you know. They can't ever be accused of anything. That's why you never think of them doing nothing wrong. That's not that true because, true, you know, a lot of bank robbers and stuff, like in the early ages, like yeah. Jesse no, James and know, his, the hey, they started... <laughs> what they think. He's not, saying, he's not saying white people don't commit crimes. What he's saying is when we're out in the street, you know, nine times out of ten, they're going to go to somebody colored before they go to the white person to go harass them, you know. And, and unless, unless you could tell me that every time you drive down the street, you see all kinds of white people being pulled over because of the car, uh, you know, kind of car they're driving or, or whatever, you know. That stuff is going on, you know, and people don't realize or they, they try to make it seem like it's not a problem, you know. And, and it is, and you guys, I know you guys get put down, but tell me, what, we don't get put down? I mean, even if you guys get put down by our race, when you guys go out to get a job, you can still get it. As sharp as their differences sound, the students all share a very personal knowledge of violence. How many of you have lost friends, 
through gang violence. Almost everybody in the room. You feel safe? I do, and it's not to lessen the tragedy and the potential, because we have the potential, and all the time my fingers are crossed. However safe the campus, Lewis cannot control what happens after school. On a recent afternoon, Ernest and his pals were hanging out when suddenly what looked like a car of rival gang members appeared. For a moment, there were fears of another drive-by shooting. I look like a crip. It was a blood thing for me. They don't like that. He wearing the wrong color. Yeah. How scared were you? I was scared. How, how scared were you guys? I'm shaking right up. now, okay? I thought they was about to shoot. I seen homeboy like looking like he was grabbing a gun or something. That scared me just now. I'm moving with you. Despite her success here, Lewis has few illusions about finding real solutions for the gang problems. I see hope for, on a small scale, an individual here and there but I'm afraid I'm a little bit pessimistic on the overall picture. I think it's gonna be very hard to turn around in our city here. What I do see, those cities that it hasn't taken hold yet, if they can get some programs going, I think that will work. But I do feel a little bad for Los Angeles right now. When we come back, we'll tell you about one of our toughest, meanest fugitives. Police want her back behind bars. Coming up, a hard-boiled barkeep from the Motor City kills to keep the good times rolling. We've used forensic busts like this before to catch fugitives, but so far it hasn't worked in the case of Norma May Baker. Maybe tonight it'll be different. Let me tell you about Norma May Baker. She owned a bar in the toughest part of Detroit. A lot of people said Norma May was even tougher. But that didn't stop Jay Baker from marrying her. Together they bought up the rest of the block and things went fine. Till Jay decided he wanted out of her life. So Norma May decided to make sure he was gone for good. She had named it the Gaiety Bar. Maybe just for laughs. It was a tough beer joint in Detroit's Cass Corridor. Good for a fight any night. Norma Baker was a force to be reckoned with. At 47, she was a woman as tough as the neighborhood. You dumb hillbilly, can't you handle nothing right? What do you want me to do, jump over the bar? Well, it'd be a first. You know, I've been thinking about just giving it all up and going back down home. I got me a fishing cabin in Huntsville, Alabama, and just taking the easy life. You didn't take Norma with you? Hell no. We've been divorced since Valentine's Day, 1969. Valentine's Day? <laughs> What's so funny about that? It's Valentine's While Jay Baker lived modestly in the corridor, Norma Baker resided in a 20-room mansion. Well, I, I, I want to go back down home to Alabama and just fish. But well, what do you want me to do about it? Well, I've been thinking that I could sail out and get my share. Sail out? Yeah. And what do you think is fair for your share? Well, I was thinking about 50000 She didn't want him to have nothing. When he left, I guess you want him to leave her just like he came there. Of course, he came there broke, but they earned it together after they was married. And then she didn't want to give it up. So late in 1976, police say Norma decided that Jay Baker was worth more dead than alive. Listen, Why are we meeting out here? Listen, I got a problem, babe. I come to you like I always do. I need your help. Well, of course. Let's... I don't care what you do. I just don't want to know about it. When the job's done, the money's yours. Here's a picture of Jay in his car. He's at the apartments every day. No problem. 
1 p.m. May 12, 1977. Jay Baker pulled into an alley behind the Gaiety Bar to do some work on one of his apartments. Jay's brother-in-law, Floyd Moore, was along to help. Bobby Bowman, a tenant, came into the alley to talk about his rent. Not now, Bobby. I'm in a hurry. I got to get this glass put in now. But I got to be down to the welfare in half an hour. When the accomplice talked, the case unraveled, and on August 10th, 1977, Norma Baker was arrested for murder. In 1980, after two trials, she was sentenced to life in prison on two counts of murder. At Wayne County Jail, good behavior paid off, and Norma earned a coveted position as a jail trustee. She was a, a tough hard, shrewd woman. And I think that's part of the reason she was such a good prisoner. Norma Jean Baker knew the system. She knew what to do, uh, not to draw attention to herself, but to quietly plot uh, what turned out to be uh, an extremely effective operation to get out of jail. April 7th, 1981. Officials say Baker managed to get herself assigned to an unsupervised cleaning detail in the jail's parking lot. That was 10 years ago. Norma Mae Baker served just 15 days of her life sentence. She's been running loose for more than a decade. Police say she can swear a blue streak and drink anyone under the table. She likes to play poker and bet thousands on the horses. This bust shows what Baker might look like today at age 63. She's probably graying and wearing glasses. If you've seen Norma Mae Baker, Pick up the phone and dial 1-800-CRIME-91. A hotline operator is waiting to talk to you. Tonight, we have an unusual report about a missing person. Three weeks ago, police in Southern California found a car with a flat tire abandoned along the highway. Denise Huber, the owner of the car, hasn't been seen since. So take a good look. Maybe you can help. Have you seen Denise Annette Huber? She stands five foot nine and weighs 130 pounds. She has blue eyes and brown hair. Denise is 23 years old. She disappeared around 2 a.m. on June 3rd. Her blue Honda Accord was found abandoned on the Corona Del Mar Freeway between Huntington Beach and Newport Beach, California. Please call if you can help. Now, you can subscribe to Hotline, the official newsletter of America's Most Wanted. Learn more about America's most wanted fugitives, the ones you helped to capture, and the ones still on the loose. Get behind the scenes information on our most famous investigation. For a year subscription, send $6 for six issues to Hotline, America's most wanted newsletter, P.O. Box 1, Van Nuys, California, 91463. Before we go, let's have another quick look at tonight's fugitives, because sometimes that's all it takes for a capture. Glendon Jack Little is charged in Oklahoma with shooting his ex-wife and killing a friend of hers. Kelvin Bryan is being sought in connection with the kidnapping of a Miami co-ed. Former policeman Joseph Harper detonated a bomb at an upstate New York utilities plant, but fled before he could be sentenced. Daryl Mutt Smith is charged with murdering a young rap singer in Sarasota, Florida. Norma Mae Baker hired an assassin to kill her husband in 1977. Next Friday night, we'll take you to South Dakota, where a man confesses to a murder, then disappears. I'm John Walsh. We'll see you then.